Good evening. Welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight for this special joint event between the Schusterman Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Texas at Austin and the Schusterman Center for Judaic and Israel Studies at the University of Oklahoma. My name is Jonathan Kaplan, and I am the director of the Schusterman Center for Jewish Studies here at UT Austin. On behalf of my colleague, Professor Alan Levinson, who directs our sister center at the University of Oklahoma, I would like to welcome you to this evening's lecture. Both of our centers owe their origins to the visionary philanthropic support of Charles and Lynn Schusterman and the Schusterman family philanthropies. Our centers have for many years exchanged faculty for lectures and gathered faculty for dinners and lunches at conferences. With the advent of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the turn to Zoom, we have been afforded new opportunities to collaborate on events and hence tonight's lecture by Dr. Mara Lee Grayson. I would like to acknowledge our co-sponsors for this event, the Department of English at OU and the Department of English and the Department of Rhetoric and Writing here at UT Austin. I would also like to thank UT Austin's Schusterman Center Administrative Associate, Emily Petrovsky, and the OU Schusterman Center's Administrative Assistant, Trice Hyman, for their work on tonight's event. Before I uh, welcome Professor Levinson to introduce our speaker for this evening, a few practical comments. Since this is a webinar, you will have uh, to pose your questions, and we very much hope you do engage in asking them, in the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. Please feel free to add your questions as you have them. We will, however, only be responding to questions put in the Q&A box, not in the chat. I will pose these questions to Dr. Grayston after her presentation. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Alan Levinson, who is the Schusterman Josie Chair in Judaic History and the G Director of the Schusterman Center for Judaic and Israel Studies at OU, and a, a wonderful scholar of modern Jewish history and thought. Professor Levinson. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Kaplan. It's been uh, just a pleasure collaborating with you over the last few years. And uh, I just uh, can't say uh, how grateful I am for uh, you and for the Schusterman Center at UT for um, just being a great partner in this event. And as you uh, rightfully said, quite a few other social and academic events. And just hope it continues for many years. Uh, it's a, a great, uh, pleasure tonight uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Mara Lee Grayson, uh, whose research focuses on the rhetorics of racism and anti-Semitism in higher education and writing studies. Grayson is the author or editor of five books, including Anti-Semitism and the White Supremacist Imaginary, Conflations and Contradictions in uh, with this explores the uh, rhetorical, historical, and racial dynamics of contemporary anti-Semitism in academic spaces. And uh, she is also the co-editor uh, of a wonderful collection, Challenging Anti-Semitism, Lessons from the Literary Classroom, which offers practical strategies for highlighting Jewish voices and combating anti-Semitism. I own it. Our library owns it. I recommend it highly, extremely useful work. Uh, her 2017 article, Race Talk in the Composition Classroom, Narrative Song Lyrics as Text for Racial Literacy, was awarded the 2018 Mark Reynolds Best Article Award, and she received an Emergent Researcher Award from the Conference on College Composition and Communication for her work on trigger warnings and racial trauma. Grayson's poetry, has been nominated for the Best of the Net and Pushcart Prizes. She is founder and chair of the Jewish Caucus of the Conference on College Composition and Communication. Originally from Brooklyn, New York, once the fifth largest city in the United States, uh, Grayson holds a PhD from Columbia University and a Master of Fine Arts from the City College of New York. Uh, a faculty member in the California State University System. She now works as Director of Content Development for the Campus Climate Initiative at Hillel International. She is currently writing a book on the rhetorical constructions of disability, 
trauma and care work in news media narratives of traumatic brain injury. It's an enormous pleasure uh, to welcome her here tonight, and she will be speaking on the topic, uh, anti-Semitism uh, and the presumption of Jewish whiteness. Uh, please welcome Dr. Mara Lee Grayson. Thank you so much. I'm going to try to do a little bit of Zoom screen sharing magic here that I've just learned that most of you probably learned quite some time ago, but I just learned like yesterday. So <laughs> please bear with me one moment. Okay. Can I get any kind of thumbs up acknowledgement that I see that someone sees a, <laughs> sees a slide on the screen and a little mini me? Thank you. Okay. So thank you so much to the Schusterman Centers for inviting me to speak with you this evening. And thanks to all who've joined. My talk this evening is called Anti-Semitism and the Presumption of Jewish Whiteness. So the research I've been doing for the past few years begins with and often comes back to this question. How do we have nuanced conversations about Jewish identities and anti-Semitism within a white Christian hegemonic society that weaponizes us? And my conclusion after all this research is not very easily. At this point, you're probably thinking, well, that's obvious. And it is fairly obvious to any of us who have tried to talk about Jewish identities or anti-Semitism, in particular over the past three months. But I hope that I can offer a little more nuance and complexity to this fairly obvious answer about the absence of nuance and complexity in such discussions. To start with, I'll address three assumptions I've made in this question, all of which are foundational to the rest of my talk. First, I pluralize Jewish identity because Jewish people conceptualize their Jewishness in a variety of ways. Second, the US is a white Christian hegemonic society. And the Christianity in question is of the Protestant variety, by the way. Third, the U.S. as a white Christian hegemonic society weaponizes Jewish people. So I want to be clear that this is not a political statement, at least no more than anything related to human beings as political. I can find something I disagree with in just about every political argument ever made and in every argument, political or not, made by a politician. But I want to emphasize this here because the weaponization and politicization of Jewish people, whether as cause or effect, are central to the conflation between Jewishness and whiteness in contemporary racial discourse. Finally, though this is not an assumption, I'll note before I move on that I use a few examples of anti-Semitism that have been covered a lot recently. I use these examples here because they have been covered so much in hopes of exploring why they have inspired such a response. So let's move on to the thing that I have really wanted to scream about. Here's the July 2022 tweet that got me and a not insubstantial portion of Jewish Twitter users screaming at our devices. I've blocked out the user's identifying details because I think this person has been dragged on the internet enough for a lifetime. Here's what the tweet said, quote, hold on, I wanna make sure I say this carefully. Yeah, Anne Frank had white privilege. Bad things happen to people with white privilege also, but don't tell the whites that, end quote. I'll give you a minute to let that marinate. So sure, we might say, this person is clearly wildly misinformed and has misunderstood some very important things about the history of whiteness. We might dismiss this person as ignorant, call them crazy or a fool, or say that the education system really failed them. Those might have been the things that my spouse said when I ran around our apartment screaming about it. I get the impulse. This tweet seems to those of us who know better, who know anything really about the Shoah, pretty damn outlandish. Obviously a Jewish child who lived in an attic for years before being murdered by Nazis during the genocide of Jewish people because she was raised Jewish did not have white privilege. Having to say that out loud is kind of painful. The problem is this isn't exactly the outlier perspective it initially seems to be. So here's actress Whoopi Goldberg speaking of the Holocaust on The View. Quote, the Holocaust isn't about race. No, it's not about race. These are two white groups of people, end quote. 
I, I have plenty of thoughts on Whoopi Goldberg, mostly related to her expressed rationale for changing her name to Goldberg, um, but now is not the time. Suffice it to say there's a history here, but that's not why I'm using this example. And I promised earlier that I was going to talk about white Christian hegemony. So I want to acknowledge the fact that I'm calling out a black woman. I'm doing this for two reasons. First, Whoopi Goldberg was suspended for two weeks for this comment. I'm not saying that was or wasn't the appropriate action, but it is notable given that generally speaking, white male celebrities have faced few consequences for overt expressions of anti-Semitism. Actor Mel Gibson, for example, has a long history of anti-Semitic comments, usually directed at women, and for claiming that Jews are to blame for all the wars throughout history. As one writer asked, how does Mel Gibson still have a career? Director Oliver Stone has complained that the Jews control the media, like we haven't heard that one before. And director Lars von Trier said he understood Hitler. How nice for him. Let's not even get into the non-Hollywood white male anti-Semites throughout history. The list is long and we really don't have time. My point is that in Whoopi Goldberg's suspension and forced apologia, we start to see how Jewishness interacts with racism and whiteness. The other reason I chose this example is actually because of something else Whoopi Goldberg said. Appearing on The Late Show not long after the situation on The View, she explained, I think of race as being something that I can see. So I see you and I know what race you are. Some journalists bristled at this, calling it another faux pas. But the logic here is really important and it tells us something about how Jewishness and whiteness are conflated. As you've probably heard many times before, race is not biologically determined, but a social construct created for the purposes of racism. In other words, race is a means by which a society categorizes people to justify a particular distribution of goods within that society. Race is a category based on phenotype, the observable characteristics of individuals. In the United States in particular, race is understood primarily in terms of color. Whiteness differs from what we understand as white privilege or the social and often political advantages afforded to those who are perceived as white. Whiteness is the underlying ideological, cultural, and structural system that both comprises and informs dominant notions of normality, morality, and simply humanity. As Tanisha Tevis, Naomi Nishi, and I explain, quote, cultural whiteness is best understood as a set of shared beliefs, values, behaviors, language, and convictions based on hegemonic ideologies that contribute to and underscore the racial identity development of white people and those in proximity to being white, unquote. The word proximity is significant when we consider the racialization of Jewish people. So this is going to be by no means a comprehensive history, and that's a disclaimer, especially for the historians in the audience, but I wanna do a little jump across historical periods here for a moment. Before there was a concept of race as we currently understand it in the US, there were Christians and heathens. In Europe, Jewish people had been conceptualized as a race in racial terms using racialized language and visual depictions. But in the colonial US, where race was defined in the contexts of slavery and the genocide of Native Americans, as historian Eric Goldstein phrased it, Jews did not become a primary focus of racial discourse. Intriguingly, as early as 1669, the South Carolina Colonies Charter had explicitly granted religious freedom even to Jews, heathens, and dissenters. The specific naming of Jews here alongside heathens rather than as heathens is an early example of the difficulty placing Jewish people into the conceptual structures of race and racism that had already begun to define the colonial US. Over the next 200 years or so, Jewish men were granted rights of citizenship, but experienced social discrimination generally expressed in racial terms. Then in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, we see widespread legal housing and employment discrimination and quotas on Jewish enrollment in higher education. Anti-Semitic propaganda was common and cartoons, magazines, and other products of popular culture depicted Jewish people with large hooked noses, thick protruding lips, and dark kinky hair. These are the same types of depictions we saw in the Middle Ages, modern Europe, and the colonial US. This is by definition racism, 
A phenotypically defined group of people separate from whiteness are systematically denied resources. But of course it can't be that simple. So-called scholars of the time who were invested in biological racism attempted to fit Jewish people into the black-white binary, but both skin color and skull measurements, the go-to metrics for biological racism, varied too much to offer definitive answers about Jewish people's racial character. The conclusion drawn by these pseudoscientists was that Jews had some African ancestry, but were a little closer to white people than black people or Native Americans were. And as Goldstein points out, commentators who spoke publicly about Jews, quote, referred to them as a distinct racial group quite apart from categories of color, often in the same breath that they tried to fit them into those categories, end quote. So now let's skip over the Holocaust when Jewish people were most certainly not white. You might be familiar with anthropologist Karen Brodkin's 1998 book, How Jews Became White Folks. Brodkin has argued that following the Holocaust, Jews in the U.S. experienced an especially rapid upward mobility into whiteness. During the 1940s and 1950s, activism and legal challenges from Jewish groups led to changes in anti-Semitic housing, employment, and university enrollment practices. There was also a fetishistic boom of philo-Semitism, evidenced by the proliferation of, for example, Jewish comedy, um, particularly Jewish jokes about Jewish women, that was a popular thing. Brodkin suggested that the absorption of Jewish people into whiteness was in part the result of the U.S.'s collective guilt and horror over the Holocaust. But I'm a bit more cynical. After all, the U.S. turned away Jewish refugees during the Holocaust, and after the Jews who were still alive were ostensibly liberated but living in displaced persons camps, the U.S. renewed restrictions to prevent Jewish immigration. So perhaps it wasn't collective guilt that led to a seeming decrease in anti-Semitism, but concerns about the perception of collective guilt. In other words, after the genocide of Jewish people in Europe, feigning Jewish acceptance made the U.S., by comparison, look good. Conceptually, views of Jewish people as a racial group were soon replaced by the framing of Jewishness as an ethnicity. In 1990, in her white identity development model, psychologist Janet Helms identified Jewish people among ethnic whites and suggested that people who identified themselves foremost by ethnicity were denying their whiteness. In 1997, philosopher of whiteness and racism Charles Mills offered more nuance, calling Jewish people white people with a question mark and noting that who is white, who is considered white, changes over time. Yet in the U.S. today, Jewish people are presumed to be racially white. Jewishness is legally understood as a religion, and the protections afforded to Jewish people in this country are afforded on the grounds of religious freedom. But here, too, we encounter problems. A few years ago, during a class discussion of race and ethnicity, a student told me she'd done an ancestry test and was puzzled by the results, which said her DNA was 96% Ashkenazi Jewish. How can my DNA, she asked, be any percentage a religion? After all, the U.S. says that Jewish is a religion and not genealogical, even though about one in five people who identify as Jewish in the U.S. also identify as atheist, agnostic, or non-religious. Views of Jewishness as a religion are complicated by the fact that, as psychologists Paulina Flash and Cheryl Fulton point out, Judaism, unlike Christianity, did not begin with a unifying idea or belief but rather Jews were a people or community with a shared history before they identified as a religious group. Genealogic, to study, genealogic studies demonstrate that people of the Jewish diaspora often share distinct genetic traits that differ from non-Jewish people living in the same regions. So Jewishness doesn't fit into a purely religious view, but Jewish diasporism and conversion complicate ethnic understandings of Jewishness and historically, being identified as a race didn't work out well for Jewish people. As historian Daniel Boyarin and anthropologist Jonathan Boyarin explained, a diasporic, a, a diasporic identity is a disaggregated identity. Jewishness disrupts the very categories of identity because it is not national, not genealogical, not religious, but all of these in dialectical tension with one another. And as Jewish rhetoric scholar Janice Fernheimer has noted, 
who is a Jew is a familiar topos, even in Jewish communities. Some scholars have suggested that, broadly speaking, there are three groups of people who self-identify as Jewish. Those who consider themselves of Jewish descent and practice Judaism as a religion. Those who consider themselves of Jewish descent but do not practice Judaism as a religion. And those who do not consider themselves of Jewish descent but have converted to Judaism. Then we have the complicating factor of phenotype. Somewhere between one in 10 and one in five Jewish people in the US have skin color that does not afford them white privilege. The reality of Jewish identity and experience is not represented in the concept of the Jewishness that dominates in US racial and racist ideology. Whether or not individual Jewish people experience white privilege in reality, the concept of the Jew in the popular imaginary is white. This brings us to what I see as the paradox of Jewish whiteness. In her Phenomenology of Whiteness, Sarah Ahmed suggested that the world has already been made into a white space that provides white bodies access to objects and spaces. Thus, race becomes a social as well as bodily given, or what we receive from others as an inheritance of this history. When bodies seen as out of place in white spaces are stopped from entering, the stoppage itself reinscribes the whiteness of the place and the bodies in it. Today, Jewish people as Jewish people do not fit in, but are not stopped from the US schema of race. We have instead been constructed outside of that schema and the particular racial discourse it has created and proliferated, a construction that contradicts the contemporary presumption of Jewish whiteness. How can we possibly make sense of this seeming contradiction? How can Jewish people, regardless of skin color, be constructed as white and outside of the racial discourse that privileges whiteness? My argument is that this contradiction is not only intentional, but necessary to the maintenance of white supremacy in the US today. So again, as we talk about the weaponization of Jewish whiteness to maintain white supremacy, let's keep in mind the caveat that many Jews are not, never have been, and never will be mistaken for white. When I talk about Jewish whiteness, I'm talking about the presumption of a certain type of whiteness. To begin with, Jewish whiteness erases, or more accurately whitewashes, the persistent racial character and history of anti-Semitism. So I've elected not to include anti-Semitic visual propaganda here, but I'm sure we can picture some of the features associated with Jewishness in the popular imaginary. A more interesting example of Jewish racialization, I think, is the much discussed use of what has been called Jew face in the recent movie, Maestro. Here on the left is Leonard Bernstein with his actual nose. And on the right, we've got Bradley Cooper playing Bernstein with a prosthetic nose. So I'm sure a lot of people are sick of talking about this particular example, which by the way, was just nominated for an Academy Award for makeup. And yes, there are other photos in which Bernstein's nose appears a little more prominent. But come on. What does this prosthetic really achieve besides signaling a certain type of Jewishness? The racial character of anti-Semitism involves the exaggeration of stereotypically Jewish features, especially the nose. Personally speaking, I love the sentiment in the headline of this article, learning to love my Jewish nose, why I got a nose ring instead of a nose job. I did not write this, by the way. I just, I think it's fabulous, fabulous title. Whether or not a Jewish nose is really a thing is debatable, but it's treated as one, even in medicine. In 2001, the American Medical Association published a report noting that, quote, plastic surgery texts continued to describe the Jewish nose as if it were a standard physical deformity requiring surgical correction, end quote. When Jewish people get nose jobs, they may not say explicitly their goal is to look less Jewish, but beauty standards are racialized. And because a particular type of nose is coded as Jewish, they don't have to say it. Jewish racialization is integral to understanding anti-Semitism and the purposes anti-Semitism serves. So consider that one of the overarching narratives of anti-Semitism is that Jewish people are members of a powerful cabal that is plotting to take over the world. 
Again, I don't have the time to go into the history or the absurdity of this narrative, except to say that I personally cannot imagine an entire cabal of Jews agreeing on anything, let alone a plan to take over the world. But I'm not entirely joking. So the propensity for Jewish disagreement and the inability to essentialize Jewish perspectives have been worked into this absurd narrative. As political scientist Stephen Bronner has explained, quote, an imagined Jewish conspiracy permeates every aspect of the totality and it is identified with both sides of every contradiction, end quote. So in the white supremacist imaginary, the mythological Jew can be and has to be anything so long as the goal is the destruction of Christianity. So where, you might ask, does racialization come in? To see Jewish people as members of a cabal that occupies all aspects of a society, Jewish people have to be constructed simultaneously as outsiders and assimilated, devils in disguise who can hide in plain sight but who are always different, not Christian, not exactly white. As Melanie K. Kantrowitz has pointed out, quote, those Jews about whom you can't tell make non-Jews anxious, end quote. So even though Jewish people are actually phenotypically diverse, the concept of the Jew has to align with a particular racialized version of Jewishness that not only makes a Jewish person identifiable, but that also allows for the anti-Semitic narrative to sustain itself. itself. If whiteness is marked by its very unwhite unmarking, visible in its invisibility, then the concept of the Jew is rooted in the notion of passing. Thus, even when conceptualized as white, Jewish people are also conceptualized as a race separate from white. The actual diversity of Jewish people complicates the popular imaginary. When race is conceptualized as what we assume we see, dark-skinned Jews become people of color and light-skinned Jews become white. Jewishness then becomes invisible. And that may be precisely the point. When we ignore the racial character of anti-Semitism, we also obscure the intergenerational trauma and ongoing discrimination and marginalization Jewish people experience. When I was little during the era of multicultural education, when we talked about racial and ethnic heritage in school, I couldn't contribute much. Like I knew that my maternal great-grandfather was a baker and that my maternal grandfather hid out on rooftops during the pogroms. When I was working on my first book about anti-Semitism, it occurred to me that most white kids probably didn't grow up hearing about pogroms as much as I did. Though children and grandchildren of Holocaust victims and survivors continue to suffer psychological impacts, and though research on the Holocaust and its impacts have helped to inform our contemporary understandings of collective and intergenerational trauma, in recent decades, as Mills has pointed out, the genocide of Jewish people has been decontextualized and subsumed under a de-raced fascism. The Shoah has been Americanized and Christianized in collective memory. We use it as a reference point, a measuring stick of in inhumanity and a lesson to learn. The meta-narrative that undergirds popular representations of the Holocaust portrays Jews as sacrificial and Christians as either heroic for intervening or transformed in retrospect, having learned about good and evil. The US receives a similar glossing despite having done virtually nothing to help Jewish people. In other words, the genocide of Jewish people becomes a Christian morality tale about which Jewish people remain far too sensitive. Yet as Ahmed has said of whiteness, bodies remember such histories even when we forget them. And even when we are presumed to be white, our Jewishness prevents us from full assimilation. So remember that definition of whiteness as shared beliefs, values, behaviors, language, and convictions? Jewish beliefs and practices are not the same as white Christian beliefs and practices, no matter how much people use the erroneous term Judeo-Christian. Jewish people have to request time off for Jewish holidays or kosher meals at professional events, requests that mark them as different from the normative Christianity in the supposedly secular U.S. I've written about the fact that the way I talk has been coded as Jewish in professional spaces. And like a lot of Jewish people I've interviewed over the years, I've experienced microaggressions and tone policing. But when Jewish people call out anti-Semitism, we are often accused of overreacting 
Multiple Jewish scholars I've spoken to recalled that when they attempted to talk about anti-Semitism, they were reminded that they were white. By encouraging assimilation, the presumption of Jewish whiteness encourages the denial of discrimination, absolves white Christian society of its everyday anti-Semitism, and prevents interrogation of Christian hegemony. If we talk about whiteness only, we don't have to talk about Christianity. Protestant Christianity determines our calendar, our celebrations, and our ways of celebrating, our discourse, and even our framings of law and religion. Christianity also influences our concepts of knowledge and means of knowledge production. Much of this is secularized in the US or understood as common sense or commonplace, so much that we may not notice its ubiquity. Christian hegemony is also woven into whiteness. According to sociologist Eduardo Benia Silva and colleagues, U.S. segregation contributes to white people's attitudes about race in the U.S. They write, quote, a group that lives in a residential and social milieu that maximizes in-group interaction and minimizes interaction with members of out-groups tends to develop similar views about out-groups, end quote. Through these insular interactions, white people develop and maintain similar rituals and belief systems that they come to see as normal and objective. Given that many U.S. states have Jewish populations at less than a tenth of a percent, the majority of Christian people in the U.S. have limited contact, if any, with Jewish people. Keeping in mind the caveat that, like Jewish people, not all Christian people are white, we might wonder why, if whiteness is influenced by segregation and shared belief systems, there's so little discussion of religion in related scholarship. In that same article by Bonilla Silva and colleagues, there's one mention of Jewishness. One study participant is identified as Jewish. We're told that the other participants are white, but they're never individually identified ethnically or religiously. In fact, when one participant refers to scripture, the researchers don't tell us what scripture the participant is referring to, though we can figure out through the text that it's Christian. Even in, Christ in critical research, in critical sociological research, Christianity is presumed as the default. Given that anti-Semitism has existed for millennia prior to racial theorizing, we can't understand anti-Semitism solely through the lens of contemporary understandings of race. That said, racialization existed long before we called it racialization. As sociologist James Thomas explained, European Christendom first constructed an ideological representation of medieval Jewry, and then worked to organize their society in such a way as to arrange European Christendom along lines of racial difference. What Thomas describes is essentially what Omi and Wenat call a racial project. And remember, during the colonial US, the language used to describe race wasn't black and white and indigenous, it was Christians and heathens. In other words, Christianity predates the concept of whiteness as the ideological basis for political white supremacy. But how do we talk about that in a society that is so deeply Christian, yet denies its own Christian character on the basis of freedom of religion? The short answer is that we don't. And as long as, as Jewish people are presumed to have skin privilege, we don't have to. Thus, the construction of Jewish people as white diverts attention from a deeply embedded white supremacy in which Christianity and whiteness are completely enmeshed. In the eyes of white supremacy, Jews are viewed as the driving forces of an alleged anti-white regime who draw on their alleged cultural, social, and economic power to subjugate, exploit, and even exterminate white people. But the eyes of white supremacy aren't only found on the faces of a few white hooded men carrying tiki torches or ranting into the social media ether. Whiteness and white supremacy, which are at root Christian, undergird the operations of our social interactions and institutions in the United States. Anti-Semitic logics are pervasive, even among people who are otherwise harmed by the logics of white supremacy. Jewish people who enter so-called so just, social justice spaces are often not likely to find Jewishness positively addressed in those spaces, and they may encounter anti-Semitism, sometimes even overtly. Anti-racism is associated with progressivism, 
while challenging anti-Semitism is somehow often framed as conservative, a framing that is virtually cemented when anti-Semitism is used by white non-Jewish people to silence non-Jewish people of color or to discredit diversity and inclusion efforts. Or to go back to an individual example I raised earlier when Whoopi Goldberg is penalized for something for which anti-Semitic white men aren't. In these contexts, Jewish people who call out anti-Semitism are sometimes accused of playing the victim by the very same people who otherwise call out discrimination and victim blaming. How did we get here? It's been suggested by some people that the actions of the Israeli government and military are contributing factors. Conflations between Israel and all Jewish people aside, I think there's more to it than that. We forget, for example, that the anti-Semitic tropes and accusations we hear today have been around far, far longer than the nation state of Israel. Around the, turn of the, around the turn of the 20th century, the infamous forgery, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, helped to popularize the evil Cabal myth. In the 1920s, in his own anti-Semitic conspiracy text, avid anti-Semite Henry Ford claimed that Jews controlled Hollywood, nationwide liquor sales, and the Federal Reserve, and were to blame for communism, jazz music, and ruining baseball. In the 1950s, racist politicians accused Zionists of plotting to destroy white Christian America through racial integration in US public schools. It's not the Jews, they said, just the Zionists. Since the 1970s, white supremacist groups have claimed that a Zionist occupation government rules the world. And in the past three months, we've seen some vaguely, erroneously, and ahistorically defined Zionism blamed not only for what's happening in Israel and Palestine, but for medical racism and police brutality in the US. I've more than once had the term thrown at me like a slur for talking about anti-Semitism here in the US. And every time the accuser has made some other anti-Semitic comments, such as about my nose or my presumed financial situation in the same breath. The appropriative uptake of the term Zionism has less to do with how Jewish people define it than it does with the pervasive mythology of anti-Semitism. And I wanna be clear again, I'm not making a political statement. And frankly, it frustrates me that as a Jewish person, I even feel the need to clarify that. I'm saying that the way we talk about Jewish people is problematic. It is problematic on the right, it is problematic on the left, and it is problematic everywhere in between because anti-Semitism is not limited to particular partisan politics. In the US, however, where racial justice is made into a matter of partisan politics, the presumption of Jewish whiteness reinforces existing stereotypes of Jews as powerful and exclusionary, and thereby prevents coalition between Jewish people and others who are harmed by white supremacy. All of this is to say that Jewish whiteness ultimately serves to maintain white supremacy. In the white supremacist imaginary, the society and its white Christian people are always in a state of crisis. Whiteness thrives on its own narrative of oppression. If the enemy is defined by skin color, the enemy is identifiable, but it's the potential for passing that makes Jewish, Jewishness dangerous to whiteness and therefore desirable to the white supremacist narrative of oppression. In other words, as long as there are Jews, white Christianity is in danger because Jews threaten whiteness as outsiders who exist within, or so says the narrative. At the same time, white supremacy needs Jewish whiteness as a distraction, a means of displacement, or what we have often referred to as a scapegoat. Whether we call them Jews, Zionists, global bankers, or other anti-Semitic epithets, Jewish people continue to be conceptualized as the overarching mythical figure, simultaneously everywhere and nowhere, cynic doke for an imagined cabal pulling the strings behind the scenes somewhere only the imaginary can explain. Jews become what Kay Kantrowitz has called super whites, or what I've described as the worst of what whiteness is and does. But I'm not convinced that the scapegoat framework tells us everything about anti-Semitism or the presumption of Jewish whiteness. I think there's more to it. So I asked about 40 minutes ago, how do we have nuanced conversations about Jewish identities and anti-Semitism within a white Christian hegemonic society that weaponizes us? And I said, not very easily. 
I would posit that at least part of the reason these conversations seem so difficult is that we are fumbling for a language that will help us put square pegs in round holes without questioning whether the round holes are part of the problem. So one more like very brief story. About a decade or so ago, I was in a doctoral seminar when a white classmate and a non-white classmate got into an argument about which category I, as a Jew, should, put, should be put into. Normally, this is the kind of thing I would have plenty to say about, but I was so uncomfortable yet simultaneously so fascinated by their attempts at categorization that I just sat there and watched the argument happen. When I'm asked for demographic information, there's no box to check for Jewish. The U.S. classifies Jewish as a religion, and entities like the Census Bureau are legally prohibited from asking about religion. Plus, I'm not what the U.S. defines in its Christian framing as religious. So what do I say? The default, because of my skin color, is white. But most research shows that somewhere between 10 and 20% of Jewish people in the U.S. don't identify or wouldn't be or couldn't be identified as white. Of course, as the Pew Research Center concluded, amount of diversity in U.S. Jewish population varies depending on definition. And we're back to being outside of or beyond racial definition. So since I've been focusing on movies, here are some Jewish women who recently signed a letter calling for more attention to Jewish representation in film and television. If we're going off skin color, what are they? What are we? We're still organizing things into black and white, white and non-white. Jewishness is a reminder that the whole thing is bullshit. None of it is real. If Jewish whiteness sustains the image of precarity in the white supremacist imaginary, real world Jewishness exposes the precarity of the racial project that defines the United States. For those who wish to see the world as a binary, Jewishness confounds because we don't fit. We never have, no matter how hard other people have tried to force us into round holes marked with vague descriptors of skin color that replaced other round holes marked Christian and heathen. If the binary isn't real, the illogical, logical foundation of white supremacy crumbles because ultimately there's nothing that holds it together besides illusions and delusions. Of course, it's not only white supremacists who believe in binaries. For many people, binaries make things easier to see, easier to understand, easier to theorize. Plus, whether we talk about it or not, the tendency toward binary thinking is deeply rooted in Western Christianity. So I'll conclude with another question. What else might we have to grapple with if the binary doesn't hold? Thank you. That is the book, by the way, if you're interested, and there's some contact information for me that I could leave up. Dr. Grayson, thank you so much for just a wonderful, wonderful lecture, really uh, provocative and engaging. Uh, and we have some time now for some, some questions from uh, our audience. Um, and, and if you haven't had a chance to ask a question and you want to pose something to uh, Dr. Grayson, please uh, take a moment. And at the bottom of your screen, you can find the uh, Q&A button. Uh, you can push that and feel free to enter uh, a question that you might have. Um, so uh, I think uh, one question that was posed is, you said that uh, white supremacy is at root Christian. Are you also saying that Christianity has white supremacy at its, at its root? I think Christianity predates white supremacy in terms of how we understand white supremacy, in terms of understanding it through whiteness. I think they are completely tied together in the United States. And I think it's, vir and not only in the United States, but I think it's virtually impossible to conceptualize one without the other. And the fact that we continue to conceptualize whiteness or try to conceptualize whiteness without Christianity, oh. in part because that is a conversational taboo, um, in part because 
it's another one of those things that's so ubiquitous that we can't see the water we swim in. Um, I think the more we try to conceptualize it that way, that's why we keep coming up against limitations and frustrations in terms of how we're understanding this concept. So one one thing was, uh, another question that was posed by uh, um, a member of our audience who identifies as Christian is, uh, what could you use some examples of what you think people who are Christian do every day that might be classed as anti-Semitic or might be things to consider? So I think I think there's probably a difference in in classing it as as anti-Semitic and classing it as, let's say, just Christian hegemonic, right? Or maybe relying on Christian privilege. Um, I think an ob a pretty obvious example that a lot of people have have used in the past that I think maybe we've gone, we've gone past a little bit is the like Merry Christmas, right? What are you doing for Christmas? Asking about, you know, asking that, even that, which for some people um, might just seem like conversation or politeness, but can, for to others is sort of a reminder that their holidays or their practices are not the norm in this society. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing that I noticed, I took a cross country road trip last year. And one of the things I noticed, I, I shared a picture in one of those slides is how many crosses there are everywhere, how many churches we pass and that ubiquity. It's not something that necessarily um, people are doing, but it's something that is placement that sort of reminds us what the society is rooted in. And one example I do recall was at a, a shopping center where you know a big sign of in God we trust was put over the shopping center. Mm -hmm. And someone chose to do that, right? That, that wasn't just automatically there. Um, and so it made me think as a person walking into that, that's not my God they're referring to, right? That's a very particular God. Right. And in the context of a, of a um, Christian hegemonic society, all of these pieces are kind of built up together. Um, another example that I would give, and I think this one is a little bit more difficult sometimes to see, um, the ways we communicate, the ways we talk to each other, um, the politeness protocol that is expected in certain places. And there's there's some good research on how like niceness is really rooted in whiteness. Um, and, and I say niceness, like niceness, not like being kind to people, but a certain way of talking about language. Um, and a way of talking about communication. Zoom, for example, does not account for my approach to communication, which is very overlapping, right? I get dinged for interruption frequently, but to me, I'm not interrupting. I'm just like trying to make meaning with people. It's exciting, but it's seen as impolite in a society that's rooted in white Christian norms. Well, Professor, Professor Levinson very politely raised his hand, so I will... Uh... Uh, uh, for a second. That's because Professor Levinson doesn't know how to post a question in the Q and A. But uh, thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kaplan. And, and, and thinking about uh, how much uh, I kind of accept, and maybe I'm thick-skinned. I accept accept Christian hegemony and Christian majority culture um, with some ease. I, I guess I would say. It's that this is a much more um, a subtle thing than, let's say, textual uh, examples. Like uh, Professor Kaplan and I both have spent a lot of time, he more than I, looking at you know the development of modern biblical critical scholarship. There, you can see in black and white uh, ad nauseum, uh, you know, a Protestant uh, Christian presumptions on all sorts of biblical texts that not only shouldn't have Protestant presumptions uh, uh, imposed upon them, but shouldn't have rabbinic Judy, Jewish presumptions imposed on them either since they're ancient Near Eastern texts. But I guess I'm, I'm saying uh, the, sort of, uh, the sort of stuff you're trying to get at, I think is inherently much more subtle and uh, much, uh, and maybe I would say also, um, less, um, uh, uh, it is, is, is much more difficult to, um, find some golden means of what would be acceptable and what wouldn't. 
It's certainly a hege- a Christian hege- that we live in a Christian hegemonic society in America is obvious, uh, especially in, in the Midwest more than in Brooklyn. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, certainly not something that can be an, I don't think it's something that in any way can be um, uh, uh, limited or should be limited or can even even uh, legally it's freedom, freedom of religious expression, isn't it? To put, uh, you know, in God we trust above our building. Well, there's there's what's legal. I mean, I think there there's a few things there, right? There's what's legally allowed, right? And then what's more of a an ethical an ethical choice or an ethical imposition, right? Um, I think part of the, you know, and I I notice this a lot in particularly in talking about whiteness, um, people really want, they want guidelines, right? They want guidelines for what should I say? What should I not say? What are the things that I should avoid? How do I stop doing this particular behavior that could be a problem? And as much as I appreciate that, because it is really, it's action oriented, I think there's a there's a bigger conceptual issue here. And I and I, I say that even I say that in in the discipline, for example, in my home discipline of rhetoric and composition in education, I think a lot of scholarly communities as well as um the public really do need to do some of that more quiet, less active thinking about how do we even understand some of this Christianity that's sort of woven into the society and the ways that Christianity, I mean, Christianity is historically, has historically appropriated Jewishness. Like the root of Christianity is the appropriation of Jewishness in many ways. We we talk about the Old Testament, right? As though somehow Jewish texts and Jewish people and Jewish thought can be superseded, right? Um, there is, that in itself is a conceptual problem that I don't think we can simply do away with like, here's the action to change. I think there needs to be a lot more consideration of our own assumptions of the things that, and I say our, right? Because even we're, even Jewish people are completely enmeshed in it in, or many, most are, I think in this country, because you sort of have to be. There are things I know for, I know even personally when I left New York, which in some ways is a much more Jewish place than many other places in this country in terms of actual population, but also cultural history and how how it's built. I started experiencing things that I had not experienced before and realizing the ways that just normative daily life is Christianized at the same time that it is secularized. So things like um, separation of church and state. Well, not everybody goes to church. Not everybody calls their houses of worship churches. Yet even the ways that we talk about freedom of religion are pretty Christian. I hope that starts to answer your question. So what are... Yeah, it's, 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 I think it's a pretty manifold question. It's sort of like asking the question, it's like raising a question about the Christianity of the founders, which drives everybody crazy, because uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, they were at least nominally Christian, all of the founders of the United States. But once you start to inspect the views actually held, there's an enormously wide range from traditional, pious, devout, Christians all the way uh, to the Thomas Jeffersons of the founding who called himself a sect of one uh, and clearly cannot be put into any orthodox Christian framework without completely ignoring most of what he wrote. And the same could be said for John Adams. Uh, so yeah, yeah, yes, it begins to get at it, but it, it's, I think, a pretty tricky question. Well, I think the challenge there is that even even if one does not profess or identify with a particular um, sect or a particular affiliation, the ways of thinking are so 
coded in their understanding of themselves and their world, the same way that we say that whiteness is if you have the privilege of white skin. So I, I want to uh, um, kind of flip, flip the question around a little bit. Uh, so uh, Senator Josh Hawley published an article uh, uh, this week in First Things advocating that uh, 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 calling for the United States to return to being a Christian nation. Uh, so in some ways arguing much like you are arguing, but from a kind of different perspective that uh, the United States was founded as a Christian nation. And part of the reason we're in all this morass of, of immorality and all of the problems from A to Z in our country are because of our failure to no longer be a Christian nation guided by the wellspring of morality that is the Ten Commandments. I, I don't want to necessarily debate Josh's, uh, Senator Hawley's argument, because um, um, that's a whole other conversation. But I want to push it around to the other point, which is there are people like Josh Hawley, who is uh, Senator Hawley, who is an avowed Christian, who would argue that the United States isn't a Christian nation at this moment because it doesn't live up to these uh, enterprises. What, what would you say to someone like Senator Hawley? I have I have a lot of things I would say to Senator Hawley, but I'm not going to share them right now. Um, I think in terms of that, there is actually a fair amount of research and I think like tons of surveys have shown that there's like, like I think 40 percent of the of the U.S. population believes that the U.S. was founded as a Christian country and 40 percent believes that it was Christian but isn't any longer or should be more. Um, so there, there are, there are, there's data that it's not just Holly, right? Um, I think there's a, there's a difference between what something is and what something should be. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a place where if the country actually wants to live up to its ideals or its stated ideals of religious freedom, there needs to be a lot more work done to understand what that really means mm -hmm. beyond you're allowed to have a church or a synagogue or a mosque, et cetera. Um, I think there's sometimes, I'm, I, I, want, I want to be careful how I state this because I think there is a, it's a really strange point that I want to make, but it sometimes feels like when we talk about whiteness and Christianity, that the overt white nationalists are almost more honest about their perspectives than people who are really trying to live by the ideals that we ought to be living by. I think in order to, they know what they want and how they how the, the world has been molded around them and to shape them. The problem is they like it that way. They think that's a good thing. Whereas those of us who think that white supremacy is not a good thing too often are not looking at the ways that we ourselves are covertly perpetuating it. Mm -hmm. And so I think for a lot of individuals and a lot of communities, there has to be a lot more introspective work to look at how are we doing this? Because we can't, you know, we're not, I'm not going to convince Josh Hawley of anything. I know that. That's not the person I'd go after. Darn, I was hoping you would. No, I'm kidding. Um, the, so one of the other d directions I want to take us is, is there's been a, 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 a one person asked a very helpful question about thinking about the contemporary moment of anti-Semitism and the frameworks of oppressor and oppressed and post-colonial rhetoric. How do you see those as influencing or not influencing um, the current uh, moment uh, with uh, influencing anti-Semitism in this current moment? I think they're I think they're too easy binaries sometimes. I think it's very it's very um tempting to want to conceptualize things as oppressor oppressed um in part because you know that gives us a good good and evil, right? That's a familiar binary and we can get into the religious connotations of that as well. Um 
But I don't think situations are always that simple. And part of what I see happening in the world right now, and particularly in the US and in scholarly US communities is I think we're, we're putting frameworks onto things that are not perfect fits. Mm -hmm. And obviously a theoretical framework is not, it can't be a perfect fit because it's a theoretical framework that we're, we're developing to try to understand something. And I think we have to be honest about the limitations of our ways of understanding things, especially when we are not closely connected to them. And it troubles me that, you know, I think we get into the place of a little intellectual hubris, um, where we think that we can make sense of something that maybe different groups of people have not been able to make sense of for themselves for 75 or thousands of years. And I, I think that it sometimes helps to try to see when we look through that binary, what are we missing? What's not fitting in there? Right. So I think I think what you're asking us to do, which I think is a very helpful uh, admonition, is to try to proceed with more critical clarity about the categories we use. And and uh, so the the binary of oppressor oppressed or this post-colonial moment that a lot of people talk about us living in may 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 not be a nimble or subtle enough category to really uh, address what, what what you're trying to get at. And to accept, I think that maybe you know, as we search for something with more clarity, maybe there isn't clarity, and that I think is sometimes a much more um, a much more troubling uh, um, prospect for a lot of people, right? That maybe there is not an answer or a solution or a singular capital T truth. Maybe yeah. there is, maybe there are multiple, maybe there is something murkier in there that we're missing because we're trying to find something clear and identifiable. Mm -hmm. And I, I want people to, I think, think around in the messiness a little bit. That's that's a very challenging uh, challenging invitation for us to take up. Um, Dr. Grayson, we really do appreciate you taking the time to be with us this evening. Uh, and, uh, and and unless uh, Dr. Levinson has any more questions, we just wanna extend a, a round of thank you to you for your time and for your insight uh, and for a very uh, profound and engaging uh, discussion and lecture uh, on anti-Semitism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Well, more.